just a little bit of context about the, the mapping of the database exercise. But first, let me start with a few preliminary comments. I'd like to thank the, the chairs for the opportunity to speak today. On behalf of the United States, I would also like to thank the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the French Agency for Development for hosting us and hosting this event. I'd also like to recognize my fellow members of the Global Donor Working Group on land, of which I think there are at least two in the audience. Um, we gratefully acknowledge their ongoing commitments to strengthen land governance and support the voluntary guidelines for the tenure of land, um, fisheries, and forests in the context of national food security. I would also like to commend the United Kingdom for their leadership as the inaugural chair of this working group. And we look forward to working with the chair next year, um, the incoming chair, which is the government of Germany. So in the context of rethinking or thinking about new approaches to rural development, which is your theme, I'm here to introduce a new initiative, a database and map of land governance programs that are funded by members of the Global Donor Working Group on Land. This group, um, as Iris stated, was created in 2012. It was formed largely to promote greater coordination, something which I heard several times today in a number of presentations, on land governance and development. In order to identify opportunities for synergy and greater coordination, the group agreed that a more clear understanding of who is doing what, where, in this, in this sector is required. Over the last year, the United States and other members of the international community have made great strides to improve coordination with respects to land governance issues, specifically with regard to the voluntary guidelines. From 2011 to 2012, I had the honor to chair the negotiations of the voluntary guidelines, which are intended to establish a clearer rights to land and other resources in developing countries. So many of you in this room, again, at least two or three of you, were part of these negotiations. And I'm looking to see if our keynote speaker is still here. He is not. So in the context of talking about now, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> so in the context of talking about complex systems, if you've ever been part of an international negotiation at the UN, you know exactly how complex <laughs> things can get. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, we were able to endorse these guidelines. But uh, in, in, uh, there were 96 countries who participated in the negotiations, civil society and the private sector. So a very complex set of negotiations, um, we think leading to a very important outcome. But nevertheless, while endorsement was an important achievement, ultimately the real value of the voluntary guidelines will be determined by their contribution to improvements in people's livelihoods in the form of better food security and nutrition more robust economic growth, and reduce conflicts over land and other natural resources. Delivering on this ambitious agenda in countries across the developing world will require coordination by development agencies, civil society organizations, governments, and the private sector. To that end, the United States, working with the Global Donor Platform and members of the Global Donor Working Group on land, led an effort um, on data collection and visualization uh, of the land and resource governance programs from 14 bilateral and multilateral donors and development agencies, including the following, Austria, and you see them here, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Germany, uh, the EU, France, Japan, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and as well as the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Bank. The result of these efforts is a database of approximately 445 programs worldwide in 119 countries, with a total estimated value of $2.8 billion. This is a rather significant investment. The database contains information on the location, duration, funding, and scope of each program, as well as information on specific aspects of the voluntary guidelines um, as addressed by each activity. So in other words, we linked each of these programs to the international agreement that was negotiated in 2012. <coughs> The database also allows donors to include links to supplemental information and resources, such as reports of program websites and points of contact for each program. In essence, we're trying to create more transparency and greater information around the subject. An interactive map of the information in the database clearly displays where different donors and development agencies are working and what they are working on with respect to land and resource governance. This information can help us and other stakeholders better coordinate our programs <coughs> and leverage our collective resources for maximum impact. As members of the Global Donor Platform well know, better communication and coordination among development partners 
can help us to avoid unnecessary duplication, share complex lessons learned, leverage limited public resources, and amplify the impact of our efforts. We hope this initiative will lead to further coordination and innovative partnerships in the land sector, and that it may provide a model for information sharing and collaboration in other sectors. So we're going to step outside the PowerPoint here for a minute to display the live version of the interactive map, which represents the information in the database. And as Dr. Meyer said, we wanted to create a tool that could clearly display where the different donors and development agencies are working and what they're working on with respect to land and resource governance and specifically supporting the voluntary guidelines. So we developed this interactive mapping tool, which is a visual display of the information in the database. And the way it's structured is that each donor from this list of donors or development agencies is represented by a single shade of this light green color. And where different donors and development agencies are implementing land and resource governance programs in the same country, the colors are layered on top of each other to create a darker shade. So where there are lighter shades on this map, there are fewer donors working on land programs. Where there are darker shades, there are more donors working on land programs. You can also filter this by any donor or development agency or any combination of donors and development agencies. So for example, we can see where Germany is working, where the UK is working, and where the United States are working all together. So again, we have different shades layered on top of each other to represent more or fewer programs. And you can click on any country in the database and pull up the information for that program. So you can see which donors are working and where they're working, the duration, the funding, the scope, the location of the project, as well as the specific aspects of the voluntary guidelines that are addressed by that program's activities. And as Dr. Meyer said, you can link to supplemental information such as the program website or supplemental reports. And just one final note on the methodology, USAID uh, played a large role in bringing together the information for this database and working with the Global Donor Platform to host the database and the maps, which we're very grateful to the platform for doing. Um, but this initiative was, was very much set up as a decentralized system. Each donor and development agency has a unique login access to the database and they are responsible for managing their own program information. So each donor uploads, edits, manages their own information, and the quality of the information represented in this database is really dependent on each donor and development agency maintaining the accuracy and timeliness of the information provided. So as we move forward uh, with uh, the donor working group on land, you can see that there are multiple possibilities for augmenting the database. We can begin to layer it with additional information in terms of um, demand, on the demand side, which programs are asking for public assistance to work on land tenure property rights issues. Um, where is the supply of technical experts in a specific country or region who you could tap into? Um, the African Union, for example. It could provide technical assistance to, to work on these issues. Eventually, I think in the next year or two, it becomes a very powerful tool um, with a number of different data sets that we could potentially use. So while this initiative, while this initiative is an important step in the right direction, the database itself is simply a means to an end. The database and map are tools that provide stakeholders with a platform for information sharing. It is up to us, the donors, governments, civil society, and the private sector to act on this information. The real value of this initiative will be measured through greater coordination and collaboration. We expect that um, the result, this will result in improved development outcomes for women and men, such as sustainable management of natural resources, more robust economic growth, better food and nutrition, and reduced conflict. Now let me give you an example of how this type of coordination can help improve people's lives. Specifically, I'd like to talk about women for a minute. I talk about women a lot, um, if you follow me on Twitter or on uh, the USAID impact blogs. 
Women produce about 43% of the food in developing countries, but own, on average, less than 10% of the land. In countries like Ethiopia, closing the gender gap in land ownership would increase, on average, crop yields by 20 to 30%. So let me show you just a two-minute video clip of Ethiopia. the positive benefits that can come from stronger property rights. Kenya and her husband are farmers in Haramaya, Ethiopia. For years, they rented land, growing just enough food for their family while also earning a small income. But in 2004, Kimia and her husband received a small plot of land from the Ethiopian government, along with a legal certificate naming both as landholders. The certificate gives them the right to use this land and protects them in case of a boundary dispute. If Kenya becomes a widow, it assures she will be recognized as the legal inheritor of the property. As a joint landholder, Kenya has a voice in decisions about how to use the land. She's expanded the area where she grows food for her family, which keeps her children healthy and in school. She's also become an entrepreneur, selling surplus produce in the market to supplement the family's income. Kimya and her husband saved enough of their income to buy a cow. They now sell milk in the market and use this money to purchase better seeds and fertilizer, which has improved their crop yield. <laughs> Providing women with more secure rights to land, homes, and other property can have a powerful impact. So, these outcomes are more likely to be realized when we coordinate. The Global uh, Donor Working Group on Land and the database and the mapping exercise all help us to do this. For example, last month, the governments of Ethiopia, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Germany formed a partnership to support the voluntary guidelines, promote responsible agricultural investment, and strengthen land rights for women and men in Ethiopia. This partnership was a direct result of the coordination efforts of the Global Donor Working Group on Land. <coughs> we hope that this type of multi-stakeholder or multi-donor partnership will be the first of many in the land sector. And we hope that this model of information sharing and coordination will be of interest to others within the development community. In keeping with the theme of thinking about new approaches to rural development, we recognize that in order to fully achieve our goals of broad-based economic growth and sustainable development, we must also increasingly work with the private sector. A growing number of private companies have recognized the financial and reputational risk of operating in country, countries characterized by weak land tenure systems. Fortunately, many companies are now seeking opportunities to invest and conduct business in ways that recognize and respect the property rights of local individuals and communities. We in the donor community have the capacity to help the private sector to develop and implement practical strategies that promote responsible investments, that recognize people's rights to help uh, to land and help lift millions out of poverty. The voluntary guidelines and the forthcoming principles for responsible agricultural investment can help guide this process. But we also need a working forward that will facilitate the transfer of knowledge and best practices <coughs> from the development community to the private sector, and a platform for private firms to consider models and build consensus. To that end, the United States hopes to work with private companies and other donors to create a private sector roundtable on land. One use of this database is to potentially help inform the private sector of where we are working on tenure issues. The United States is planning to sponsor several events at this year's World Bank Land and Poverty Conference, and we will bring together private sector interests and development actors to help move this agenda forward. We hope this will be of interest to other donors working in the land sector. In close, we look forward to continuing working with you on these and other important initiatives. Thank you very much.